Um, it's almost it's almost done on the YouTube front. So give me one minute. Perfect. Okay, we're live on YouTube. So Jesse, if you want to start the broadcast, and it looks good on YouTube. Excellent. Thanks. So hi everyone today that that is that are joining me. Excuse me. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us for another session of Links presented by Chainalysis. I'm Jesse Spiro, and I am the Global Head of Policy at Chainalysis. I'm excited to be joined today by Jim Lee, the Chief of IRS Criminal Investigations in the U.S., and Bert Langerak, the FIOD's Managing Director in the Netherlands. And we're here today to discuss the J5 Partnership. The Joint Chiefs of Global Tax Enforcement, known as the J5, are committed to the combating transnational tax crime through enforcement and collaboration. They work together to gather information, share intelligence, conduct operations, and build the capacity of tax crime enforcement officials. Just two years after the formation of the group, the J5 is already seeing operational successes. So I'm really looking forward today to your insights and our discussion, gentlemen. Uh, and you know, I, I think that this is a very unique panel that I'm very excited about for a number of different reasons. First, in relation to the appetite within the industry, there has been increasing dialogue in relation to that intersection between tax and crime and where that sits in relation to the virtual asset industry, which is just further developing as the price of, of virtual assets continues to climb, and the adoption continues to uh, climb accordingly. So uh, I'm also excited about this session because we're doing it in a very unique way. So we're kicking this off by the three of us having dis a discussion about kind of the high level uh, uh, and, and leadership stakes and approaches that you're taking to these issues. But then we're going to pivot and you're going to make my job easier because I'm going to be able to pass the microphone and you're going to talk more to the technical uh, with some of your investigators in relation to uh, some of the, uh, you know, potential difficulties that you face and the unique uh, situations that occur in relation to these kinds of investigations. So it will be a great balance and hopefully will provide unprecedented visibility into uh, this ecosystem and the kind of work that you're doing in relation to tax crime here. Um, so before we jump in, I'll give some, some brief bios for the audience if they're not familiar. Bert Langerak uh, is the director of the Dutch FIOD, which is the Fiscal Information and Investigation Division and has been so since 2011. From 2011 till August of 2020, he was the Chief of Criminal Investigation of the FIOD. Uh, and the FIOD is the Criminal Investigation Service in the field of tax and financial, economic crime, corruption, and anti-money laundering. And from August 2020 until present, uh, he is the Managing Director. Bert, thank you so much for being here with us today. Jim serves as the Chief of IRS Criminal Investigation. In this position, he oversees a worldwide staff of approximately 3,000 employees, including 2,000 special agents in 21 field offices and 11 foreign countries. He leads and oversees some of the most significant investigations of financial crimes involving tax, money laundering, public corruption, cyber, ID theft, narcotics, and terrorism financing. Prior to this assignment, Jim's executive positions included serving as the Director of Field Operations North, the Director of Field Operations South, the Director of Strategy and Executive uh, Special Agent in Charge of the Chicago Field Office. So before we really dive in, I just would also briefly like to introduce Chainalysis to those of you that may not know us. Chainalysis is the blockchain analysis company. We provide data, software, services, and research to government agencies, exchanges, financial institutions, and insurance and cybersecurity firms in over 50 countries. Our data platform powers investigations, compliance, and risk management tools that have been used to solve some of the world's most high-profile cyber criminal cases and grow consumer access to the virtual asset space safely. So again, thank you very much to both of you for being here, and I guess we have a number of themes and kind of topics we're going to discuss today. Uh, but the first question that I would like to pose to both of you is, how do you both think about the intersection of cryptocurrency and tax? Okay, hey, Bert, I'll, I'll jump in, Bert, uh, first on that. And I, you know, 
thanks for the introduction, Jesse, and, and, uh, and, and really thanks to everybody for tuning in today. And I hope uh, you know, that everybody's staying safe during these challenging times, preparing for a, a relaxing holiday. Um, and I'm already looking forward to the next time we can do this in person. Um, I am at home today, so hoping that uh, we can get through this without my dogs going bananas uh, and, and um, uh, you know, maybe my kids coming up there in virtual school and asking me for uh, help with math. So I uh, also want to, you know, thank Bert and his team for joining today as this is simply, you know, one more clear example um, that the J5 relationship is strong, that our relationship is strong and that we're collaborating significantly, really more than we ever have before. So the intersection between crypto and tax, um, real quick, you know, you can't deny the impact that crypto has had on the world. You know, the global economy, investments, day-to-day uh, -day commerce. I mean, you can buy a cup of coffee, you can buy a sandwich with crypto now. Um, IRS and US, we classify it as property. So there's a direct intersection with our tax system. Um, the, the dominant amount uh, of public facing criminal cases thus far, as you know, we've had a lot of publicity uh, involving crypto, have really been in the money laundering arena. However, you know, recently uh, we've seen our first criminal cases involving tax charges here uh, and crypt involving cryptocurrency. Just, just real quick, you know, John McAfee recently charged with evading taxes after uh, failing to report income, you know, coincidentally from promoting. Uh, uh, cryptocurrency. And then, uh, you know, I, I can't remember the name right off the top of my head, but a former Microsoft employee, we, we just received the first sentence of a Bitcoin case with a tax component. So bottom line, you know, crypto makes filing transactions more complicated. Yes. But that's what we specialize in, following the money, no matter how complicated. So we've had great successes in the area. Uh, best in the U.S. Uh, government, I'd say. I'll turn it over back to you, Bert. Thank you, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, nice to be here uh, from this side of uh, the uh, the ocean. Uh, what we see in the Netherlands is um, uh, first, maybe it's interesting that um, cryptocurrencies are just legal. Uh, it's a modern, flexible, cheap payment method, and uh, we think that's uh, that's that's okay with that. Uh, and what we see is their use is uh, increasing here in Europe and uh, in the Netherlands. It's more and more used for a few years now. We already have uh, also uh, ATM, uh, Bitcoin uh, machines and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's also for the audience, it's good to realize that uh, the great majority is just legal and most of the companies involved in the Netherlands are reliable, even in the, in the, the cryptocurrencies. Mostly it's uh, for the mindset, it's, it's uh, good to realize that uh, most companies involved, it's re re uh, reliable and it's uh, for good practice. But um, what we see in the Netherlands um, uh, for tax and taxation, in the Netherlands, if you pay tax, uh, you have to pay tax on the value of your cryptocurrencies. We see them uh, just as an ordinary value, just like real estate or uh, money, in your bank, uh, money in your bank account. But what we also see, unfortunately, is um, that uh, the cryptocurrencies are increasingly uh, being used as a criminal means of payments more and more. And we see also uh, as a value to hold illegal money, tax money. Uh, and uh, even most, uh, Jim said it already, uh, what we see is a money laundering method with uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, and we also see from tax uh, side of uh, the cases that uh, the money from tax fraud is also converted into cryptocurrencies to make it more uh, anonymous uh, to find it for us. And what we see in, uh, within Europe, uh, Europol uh, estimates that the criminal use of uh, Europe for money laundering uh, with cryptocurrencies is uh, around uh, 6 billion US dollars uh, every year. So there's a lot of money involved uh, in that kind of uh, uh, schemes and uh, tax fraud. So that's why we as, uh, as FIOT in the Netherlands are, are more and more interested in uh, the side of cryptocurrency. Uh, not because we don't trust cryptocurrency, but we see we have investigated it. And we also, uh, Jim already said it, we are a financial institution uh, uh, service, uh, the field. So we follow the, the money. And I say nowadays we follow the value because cryptocurrency more and more is one of the values uh, involved. And that explains our interest in, in cryptocurrencies. So that's really helpful. And, and a couple of themes there. One in relation to, you know, 
how, how you're viewing cryptocurrency, it is an asset and subject to the same tax requirements is, is something that's universal that we're hearing. Also, I think in relation to the illicit, when, when you guys are talking about this, you also treat it as such, right? In relation to how you investigate and you effectively prosecute. And I think that that messaging and that core messaging is something that is very important to share because there is still this gap, right? In relation to, I think, people's application of their knowledge about what they are required to do in relation to uh, taxes as they pertain to virtual assets. And to your point, you know, we're seeing this, this kind of growth. And I think that you both would agree also that that is encouraging, you know, um, but obviously within the controls that exist uh, around the laws that exist and around financial integrity as a whole. So, I'll jump now to another question for you, Bert. And, and the next question that I have is, you know, why is international cooperation so important? And especially in relation to J5 and your operations, why is international co cooperation so important? Yeah, international cooperation is key. It's, it's uh, what we see is uh, we are uh, a financial investigation service. And what we see is that uh, the money flows all over the world. And uh, the criminals uh, make use of the opportunities uh, offered uh, by different countries. Uh, what we see uh, is in uh, our work, it's more and more uh, transnational and international. Uh, criminals and fraudsters uh, are not concerned with national borders. We, we think still are picking national borders uh, from our own institutions, but criminals are already uh, a step uh, uh, forward for that um, and in fact they even make use of the differences between the countries and that in terms of regulations legislations where to hide the money the assets so they make use of the differences and that's uh, what we see that makes it um, uh, uh, it's very complex for us so we have to work together uh, with other countries and what we always uh, always see is that um, the criminals also make use of complex international uh, business and uh, financial structures and they're trying to uh, disguise and mix the criminal flows of money and even cryptocurrencies with legal flows of money and property. So that's very important for us. And uh, what we're trying to do with, uh, with J5, uh, with, the, with those five countries, is uh, we're trying uh, what we call uh, bridging the gap and focus on, on uh, operational cooperation to tackle international tax fraud. That's why we, uh, we joined forces, because uh, it's more and more transnational. And we can only uh, solve this problem if we work together. Uh, and that's not only on working together, operational, but also uh, share knowledge and uh, experiences. And uh, what's even uh, important for J5 is we are, uh, I always say, with the, the three most important things for J5 is operational, operational, operational. Because uh, we work together, closely together with other organizations, uh, worldwide organizations like OECD and uh, JITSIC and, and uh, World Bank. But they are more um, uh, have a focus on policy. What we do is operational working together, bring people together and fight tax crime transnationally. So that's helpful. And, and to your point, you know, with, with the cross-border flows, with what we see in relation to regulatory arbitrage and how, you know, the criminals are targeting different kinds of jurisdictions, I think that that messaging is so important, you know, and that approach more to the point is so important. So now I'll jump, jump to you, Jim, and, and you know, Operational results is something, obviously, uh, as Bert just mentioned, that's very important and strategically very important. Uh, you know, international collaboration is not new, but the J5 is focused on operational result, results. So uh, to that, can you talk a little bit about your charter for the organization itself? Sure, sure. Thanks, Jesse. And, and, and well said, Bert. Um, you know, you, you mentioned it kind of in your open, Jesse, the, the, the Joint Chiefs of Global Tax Enforcement, the J-5, you know, was really born as a result of a, uh, say, a call to action from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Uh, it was a meeting in London, uh, in London for the countries to do more. And as a result of that call to action, um, criminal tax heads uh, from Australia, Canada, the Netherlands, UK, and U.S., expressed, you know, a desire, you know, to work, to work more collaboratively together, you know, hence the J5 was formed. Um, the opening meeting for the full J5 group was held in June of 2018 in Canada. Therefore, you know, the J5 recently held its two-year anniversary. And, uh, you know, Bert touched on this. 
uh, one of the key components around forming this organization was that it had to be operational in nature. You know, as opposed to a heavy bureaucratic or policy driven organization, the, the operational emphasis has been, you know, will continue to be the focus of the group. And when I say operational, I mean operational with a fo focus in tackling, you know, tax crime as well as, as well as other financial related crimes. And, you know, when we talk about charter, you know, you, uh, in your intro, Jesse, you, you, you pretty much went over the mission of the J5, but I mean, a general, just a kind of a general summary. I mean, it's essentially that this group is committed to combating tax crime through, you know, increased enforcement collaboration, working together to gather information, share intelligence, uh, conduct operations and build capacity, um, uh, you know, of tax crime enforcement officials. And I think the last comment I'll, I'll make is uh, to accomplish all this, you know, the J5 is really organized into, you know, we have the chiefs obviously, but it's organized into four working groups that routinely communicate and work together. And those working groups, you know, really built around uh, professional enablers, um, cyber, and, cyber and virtual currency, uh, you know, platforms and, and data, and then communications. Uh, you know, to, to help drive the deterrent effect of uh, international tax crime. So turn it back to you, Jesse. Thank you. I mean, that, that's really, you know, helpful. And, and you know, in, in mentioning kind of the specific strategic initiatives, the workflows, uh, and most importantly, I'd say that, uh, you know, uh, intergovernmental collaboration. A question for, for you, uh, piggybacking on that for you, Bert, is, you know, what do you see as being the biggest challenge to that kind of collaboration? You know, we talked about intelligence sharing, information mm -hmm. sharing, capacity building. What do you think the biggest challenge is? Uh, yeah, there are a few challenges, uh, information sharing, but also what I think, and I, I already mentioned it, is uh, what we do is we uh, still think in uh, countries. Uh, each country has their own uh, laws, regulations, uh, legal powers. And what we see more and more, the flowing, uh, the, <coughs> the money is flowing around all over the world, and the criminals uh, are not thinking anymore in their country. They think globally. They know no boundaries and make even use of the of the differences. And that is what we uh, as J5 has to deal with. But what we uh, did within J J5 is um, that uh, that we see these challenges also as an opportunity. What we're trying to do is uh, in our strategy also is to try, uh, to try to make use of the differences between those countries and these organizations. Um, how we can uh, better tackle the, uh, some uh, trends and some cases. Uh, we're trying to be uh, creative within the legal framework. And if you uh, see all the national legislations and legal powers uh, together, uh, we have more options. Together we are strong. So um, we're trying to see as, is, uh, as a chance because we uh, are operational. We are not from the policy, that's for other uh, institutions, but we're trying to make use of uh, the differences in our organization, not only in knowledge and experiences, but also in uh, the possibilities. And one of the examples, and I think it's a, it's a nice example, is that uh, we are now uh, enrolling a system within J5 for international secure data matching and uh, sharing information. And uh, we call it FCI net, Financial uh, Criminal Investigation net. And we're trying to speed up the process of international information sharing because that's a big problem, the information sharing. If it's possible for, uh, for people, for criminals, uh, uh, for money in, in one minute, uh, the money is going the, uh, around the world uh, three times. And uh, we have an, uh, a difficult uh, legal uh, system for sharing uh, information. So we're trying to do that and to uh, speed up the process of in, uh, international information sharing. And that's very nice at FCI Net because it's uh, decentralized and it's virtual computer network and it's new, it's uh, creative. And we're trying to uh, use that uh, for our law enforcement agencies and even for tax administrations. And that's what I think is uh, precisely what J5 uh, is about. Uh, uh, that we can... Um, uh, use all uh, necessary and useful operation and uh, the cooperation together. And uh, that's why I strongly believe in J5 because uh, that's the way for e effectively uh, tackling transnational tax fraud. Uh, we can only do that together. And that's very, very important. So it's 
uh, difficult for information sharing. So we're trying to deal with that. And we're trying to see the opportunities uh, and use the differences between, between our countries and our organizations. Yeah, I mean, I think you raise great points. You know, the speed and the velocity in which these kinds of payments can be be processed re requires agility by by these kinds of organizations and trans transnational organized criminal groups and these criminals, right, are collaborating and operating in such a fashion. So uh, the same is necessary, right? Right, transnational uh, cooperation in relation to combating the financial crime in this space. Um, the next question is is for you, Jim, and it's actually a two part question. Uh, first is, you know, uh, I want to ask a question about the most recent challenge that was hosted. Um, but, but before I do that, uh, many people and attendees are probably not familiar with, with uh, what these challenge events are that the J5 hosts. So the first part is, uh, what are the challenge events that you host? And the second is, can you discuss, you know, the last challenge that was held in LA a year ago? You know, what you learned and took away from there and what results came from that event? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Jesse. Um, so the challenges that you're referring to, this is, <laughs> this is a great concept. Um, the value of these challenges really cannot be overstated. Stated. So I'll start with that. Um, these challenges, the way we do this, essentially, we bring together some of the smartest people from each J5 partner country, you know, with various skill sets and expertise. You know, I'm talking about data scientists, tech experts, crypto experts, investigators. You know, sarcastically, I say we, we lock them in a room together for a few days. They all bring real data to you. We ask them to collaborate and brainstorm ideas uh, and produce results in a coordinated push to track down individuals perpetrating, you know, tax crimes around the world. Um, which they have, and, and the results have been um, impressive. Uh, the Netherlands hosted uh, our first ever uh, J5 challenge that really focused on, uh, you know, professional enablers facilitating offshore fraud uh, and, and the development of a platform to manipulate all this data that's available. And then the U.S. hosted a, a second challenge in 2019. First one was in 2018. Second one was in 2019. Same, same focus on egregious tax offenders, um, uh, but, it, but that had a more of a cryptocurrency feel to it. So when I describe the challengers, picture, you know, like I said, experts from each country gathered around using data from a variety of open uh, and investigative sources it's available to each country, you know, including uh, offshore account information, um, and then using or developing um, you know, various uh, analytical tools to find schemes, identify uh, potential offenders, and then propose action to the J5 leadership to address these threats. And, you know, as far as the most recent challenge, you're referring to the one that we did in LA 2019. And, you know, in general, you know, what, uh, you know, regarding that challenge, you know, I can really speak for both challenges. What we've, what we've really learned is that, Offenders are embracing more and more complex methods to conceal their, their wrongdoing. Um, they're creating structures that are split across jurisdictions, uh, across borders, taking advantage of those areas that offer secrecy or regulatory uh, benefits. And, you know, the great thing about the J5 challenge concept and the working groups is that they, they can quickly adapt to these changing behaviors to prioritize um, operational activity, you know, to tackle whatever the threat picture is. So the challenge in 2019, the most recent one, really built on successes of, you know, previous collaboration. You know, countries came together, used a number of real data sets, learned about each country's skill sets and abilities, used cutting edge platforms, and developed uh, right around 50 leads for real cases that were ready for immediate investigation you know, or are ongoing now, or, you know, are being, or, yeah, are being worked by J5 partners, you know, right at this time. So one important thing I'll mention, the teams were supported by private contractors, you know, running data queries and, you know, and you know, writing code to support case development. And, and that public-private partnership is critical. I think you touched on it uh, maybe in your opening, Jesse. And, you know, in my mind, you know, the challenge is just one more thing 
that helps confirm the true power and benefit of these J5 partnerships. I mean, at the end of the day, um, after any challenge is complete, the first one or the second one, um, each country walks away with new investigative leads, uh, 50, the last one. Um, the investigators walk away with the ability to further cases um, you know, using tools and techniques created by bringing these various skill sets together from each country. Um, there's an increased ability to share information and find you know, similar patterns in the future. Uh, and I should also note, you know, that that um, the work done at these challenges, you know, connections are made, you know, where individual efforts would take years to make those same connections. So I expect these challenges to be uh, a more routine occurrence as we move forward into the future uh, with the J5 partners. I mean, that's, that's really powerful. And what you're talking about sounds like conceptually like an investigative tech sprint that bring together, bringing together, excuse me, the best and the brightest and the technologies and the resources and the intelligence. And fi I mean, 50 leads, you know, the, the proof is in, in the uh, methodology, I suppose, and, and what you're doing. So that's uh, very exciting, I think, to hear about from my personal perspective and, and encouraging in relation to the work that, that you're able to do. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to, to move in a different direction briefly, Bert, and, and you know, I, I think one of the questions the audience might have, uh, or many in the audience might have, is you know, in relation to the, these illicit financial flows that we're talking about, specifically in relation to the work that J5 is doing, you know, where do you see the, the money going? You know, wh where are these illicit financial flows going? Uh, good question. Uh, what we see is uh, a lot of money uh, flowing around all over the world, um, even in our own our organization within the field. Um, most of the cases we do, 80-90% of uh, the cases, uh, the money is going uh, transnational cross-border. Uh, and there are many financial hubs in the, in the world. Uh, I think the audience uh, know a lot of them. Um, and uh, they're looking for the, the financial hubs in the world that can be interested for uh, the concealing for, uh, of money and, uh, and assets. And uh, what you see in international reports and what we see in uh, our uh, investigations is that there are such uh, several of such places uh, in the world, uh, partly in stable uh, countries with a good financial structure, high degree of automation, even countries uh, of the J5 itself, uh, others, you can see uh, the financial uh, structure of uh, the banks in London, uh, even the Netherlands. Uh, you can see some uh, uh, over <clears throat> in other parts of the world, uh, like uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Panama, all countries, uh, financial hubs, but also the, the J5 countries itself. Uh, but we, more and more what we see is, uh, and that could be interesting, is um, that even in less developed countries, more and more we see that uh, as a uh, financial hub. And uh, we see now more and more that uh, money and also cryptocurrencies and even uh, other kind of goods that are used instead of, of money uh, is used uh, in other continents, and, uh, such as Asia and uh, even Africa. And what we're trying to do with, uh, with the A5, not only with, the, with, our, with our countries, therefore we have two projects uh, together with World Bank. And uh, one of the projects is what we call uh, fighting tax crime in Asia. And uh, Indonesia and the Philippines are involved in that project. And other pro projects that we're doing, uh, dealing with uh, within J5 is uh, uh, with the Af uh, Africa uh, countries like uh, Kenya and Uganda. And uh, what we are trying to do is um, in these projects is um, uh, they're, they're, they're now a little bit uh, uh, progressing slowly because of uh, COVID-19. Uh, eh? We know that, uh, that problem. But uh, in uh, both projects, uh, we make a connection also uh, uh, with uh, other uh, uh, institutions like the Tax uh, Crime Academy of the OECD. What we're trying to do is to, to, to uh, uh, share the, our knowledge and experience with that uh, uh, kind of countries uh, in Africa and uh, East, uh, uh, in, in East Africa and Asia, but also to learn from them because they are sometimes even smarter than we are. They're in Africa uh, for many, many years, they use the, the telephones to make connection and uh, move assets 
and values around only with a telephone. That was at the period of time that we only use banks. So we can also learn something from that. But what, what we see, and that was your question, and uh, where we see the money uh, going around, it's the use cases, uh, the, the use countries, uh, what you can uh, read in your international reports, but also more and more in the less developed countries. So I had, I had a number of other questions that I wanted to ask you both, but I, I do know that we have a second segment of the session and we do want to open it up for some questions. Uh, so I think I'm going to uh, kind of close out this session with uh, one last question for Jim before we transition, which is, Holistically, you know, what, what opportunities do you see for the future of the J5, Jim? So, no, it's a good, good question. Um, future is really wide open, you know, for the organization. You know, like I talked about, we're collaborating a lot, we're talking a lot. Um, well, we really are uh, uh, just hitting our stride now and seeing operational results starting to come to fruition. And that's very energizing. Um, I see um, more public facing, you know, operational results uh, here in the near future uh, and more you know, regular international actions, you know, in the coming year. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, you get the que uh, question about, you know, do, do we, does the group expand or do we focus on other areas? And I think those are, you know, all questions that the collective chiefs, you know, will strategically discuss and answer, uh, you know, as we, you know, as time moves on. You know, one thing for sure is that the size and flexibility needs to remain nimble. Um, and those are assets to us right now. And I, I, uh, I, I, you know, I feel I speak on behalf of all the chiefs that, you know, the continued emphasis on promoters and professional enablers of tax evasion schemes and offshore uh, service providers, offshore banks, your virtual currency, those are always going to be critical. You know, hence my, my comment about uh, continued uh, emphasis being necessary. And, you know, um, Bert touched on you know, some of the data platforms and some of the technology. I do see an opportunity, you know, to continue to expand and grow our uh, technology breakthroughs. You know, the data and platforms group continues to work on tools that uh, it's only going to allow the country to analyze data sets in real time, you know, within, within the constraints of laws of each country, you know, which only make us all more efficient. Excellent. So uh, we're about to we're about to transition over, and as we wait for your your colleagues to to jump on and to open up their videos for for the next segment of the session, I'll just add uh, in relation to housekeeping. I forgot one thing at the beginning of the session, which is that for any of the attendees that have questions, you really have some unprecedented access here to ask questions you might have. Just ask them through the Q and A box, and we'll attempt to address them at the end of the session uh, where applicable. Um, so with that, I believe uh, if, if the investigators can join and, and turn on their video, I will uh, formally pass the microphone, the virtual microphone to, to you, Jim. Now, thanks, Jesse. And I'm waiting to see them come on, but maybe while they're, okay, there we go, as we work it out. So <laughs> yeah, I, um, I'm gonna introduce, you know, the first two, panelists that I'm going to have here, and then I'll turn it over to Bert. So I'm really excited to introduce these two from uh, IRS uh, criminal investigation. The first, Oleg uh, Polbareko, uh, originally from the Ukraine, see him there. Um, he's been a special agent with CI now for 10 years and works high profile cryptocurrency financial investigation. He's a leader of our Western Area Cyber Crimes Unit in the U.S., and he's our J5 lead for the crypto uh, group that I mentioned earlier. So thanks for joining us, Oleg. And the other panelist I want to introduce is uh, Sean Magruder. And he works extensively with CI as a block trace contractor. He's certified. He is a certified virtual currency investigator and has experience in working with numerous blockchain analytical tools such as Chainalysis, CypherTrace, Coinbase Analytics, TRM Labs, and Elliptic. He, he actively ex assists in complex investigations which involve virtual currencies, money laundering, and cyber-related areas. And you know, he's a U.S. Army combat vet you know, who served with the Fifth uh, Special Forces Group, uh, Airborne, you know, where he deployed to the Middle East in support of counterterrorism operations. So, Sean, thank you very much for uh, joining us today, and thank you very much for your service. 
And I will, with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Bert to introduce his two uh, panelists today. Thank you, uh, Jim. I will uh, have a short introduction of, uh, of our uh, panelists. Uh, I'm proud, also proud to uh, present uh, the field members of uh, the panel. It's uh, Jocelyn, and you can see the difference. The nice pink uh, sweater. And uh, <laughs> Gert Jan with the, with the field jacket uh, <laughs> just behind him. Um, uh, within the field, we have a special, uh, what we call a cyber team, a team of uh, dedicated uh, detectives uh, with a, no a lot of knowledge about and experience in the field of cybercrime. And uh, both of them, uh, Jocelyn and uh, Gert Jan, are members of that team, the field financial advanced cyber team. And uh, Jocelyn is uh, advisor on uh, financial cybercrime and Gert Jan is the tactical cyber investigation specialist. They know a lot about uh, cryptocurrency and cyber, <laughs> far more than I have. And uh, what I said, I'm <laughs> proud uh, to present them and let's hope we have a good discussion. Uh, yeah, no, thanks, Bert. I uh, I uh, <laughs> fully agree with you. Um, <laughs> I'll uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Oleg first. Uh, um, ask a couple of questions, and I'll turn it back over to you, Bert. But first question, uh, Oleg, um, what would you say is a notable accomplishment related to joint multinational cyber investigations involving cryptocurrency that includes J five numbers? Thanks, Chief, first of all, for introduction. Um, for better or worse, there has been a noticeable shift in the behavior of bad actors committing the cyber crimes with the uh, cryptocurrencies. Similar to conventional criminal activities, there is a learning curve with respect to every evolving iterative behavior of bad actors when the one is caught by law enforcement and the mechanism used to catch them are revealed. They learn from the law enforcement efforts to shut down the criminal enterprises. The shift is more inclusive multinational joint effort by law enforcement from the J5 and around the globe has forced these bad actors to change the way of conducting the cyber crimes activities, which brings with it new challenges. And um, for example, uh, the, of this might be displacement of uh, and the relocation of some darknet market customers and darknet market vendors from the Alpha Bay takedown who shifted to Hansa before it was shut down as well. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Um, let, me, let me kind of switch direction slightly. Um, another question for you, Oleg. Um, can you talk about um, how is the J5 tackling you know, dark net market um, laundering throughout the globe, money laundering throughout the globe? Um, that's a really good question, Chief. Um, the J5 and IRS as a whole is definitely the leader in a combative cryptocurrency related illicit, uh, illicit activity. Uh, we have an incredibly talented team of uh, special agents, uh, computer and data scientists, and uh, cryptocurrency experts. In addition to partnering with companies and data providers such as chain analysis, we partner with numerous companies to address some of these challenges. Uh, we also work with a block trace, for example, who has built a cryptocurrency platform with the real-time alerts for detecting uh, transfers from a darknet um, to various exchanges and, uh, and services throughout the United States and J5 countries. This real-time alert system enables our J5 partners to quickly investigate crimes associated with this type of transactions. As it relates to cryptocurrency-related investigations, uh, we used to, uh, used to be a month or weeks. It's only days, if not hours. We often uh, times write in the tale as such as uh, we expect for the number of arrests and seizures to increase in the near future. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Oleg. I mean, truly a, uh, a challenging area. And I know uh, I know your team and the teams in the U.S. and J5 partners are up to the challenge. So, uh, look, Bert, why don't I uh, transition over to you for a couple of questions? Okay, thank you. Um, and it, uh, it would be to be uh, to, too easy uh, to start with the lady. Eh? That's normal uh, yeah. in this uh, kind of <laughs> sessions. But we're from the Netherlands, so always a little bit different. So I will start <laughs> with uh, Gert-Jan, if you're uh, all right with that. Uh, Gert-Jan, maybe um, a question that I have is, um, 
what are effective approaches in tackling crypt, uh, cryptocurrency crime? Can you tell us something about that in your uh, opinion? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and thank you for giving me the chance to be on the panel. It's very, uh, very interesting. Um, I think there's, there's uh, various approaches, in, in uh, good approaches in tackling cryptocurrency crime. Uh, I think on the one hand, we use more uh, traditional approaches, but we also always try to look for new novel approaches. And we don't just do this on our own, but of course, in collaboration with our uh, J5 partners. Um, but if I, if I have to give some examples, uh, I think I can give three. Um, as already mentioned several times, we always look at, uh, at tax. So also with cryptocurrency crime, we look at the, the tax returns and the inexplicable wealth of individuals who have been active within or with cryptocurrency. Um, this often gives us interesting leads. It's the first uh, example. The second is that we always try to uh, locate, freeze and seize funds internationally um, of individuals active in um, cryptocurrency crime. Of course, also with the help of our partners. Um, and a very important uh, last point that I want, want to talk about is um, identifying and targeting international facilitators of cryptocurrency crime. Um, yeah, if you, if you can get a facilitator, that's always yeah. great. Um, yeah, it's always great. So yeah. if I can give one example of something we, uh, one facilitator we looked at. Um, well, first of all, these facilitators, uh, they have changed over the years. So first we had more uh, individual facilitators who um, did transactions on the streets and exchange crypto for cash and try to um, keep criminals out of sight in this way, out of the hands of law enforcement. But now we are also seeing more and more, um, more and more of this happening on an organized scale. So for example, through uh, Bitcoin ATM companies and cryptocurrency mixers. And that's the one example I want to give um, of a facilitator that we uh, tackled, so to say, uh, it's Best Mixer. That's, um, when we uh, took over Best Mixer, we, we got a lot of insights in how to such a criminal cryptocurrency facilitator works. And we were, we were able to look right through it from the, the criminal source till the, till the endpoint. And we've actively shared this data from Best Mixer with our J5 partners, uh, European partners, and um, well, many countries on the globe. And in this way, we, we've shown that tackling just one facilitator can help solve many um, cybercrime cases. Okay. Thank you, uh, Gertjan. Uh, and maybe uh, later on, uh, I know that uh, Jocelyn has, be, has been involved in the best mix. Maybe she can, she can tell something about that because I'm very proud as uh, the chief uh, of the field in uh, that case, as a big case for, uh, for our country and our organization. Uh, Gertjan, maybe a, a second question for you is, um, you gave some uh, approaches, but uh, we're talking about J5. Eh? Can you tell something uh, about to the audience uh, a success story of J5, an example? Um, yes, I can. The first one is, um, well, as I just mentioned, Best Mixer is an interesting one. Of course, we've shared with all the countries. Um, but another example that I can give is um, BitClub Network, which um, it's not just, uh, well, it's not, it's mainly a success by the IRS, of course, but we, during the, the challenge in Los Angeles, we, we've also um, shared some intel and uh, had some results based on that. Um, and we've, um, there's, there's a variety of leads that have come from uh, cooperation within the J5, as already mentioned by, uh, by Mr. Lee. Okay, thank you, uh, Gertjan. Uh, I think uh, enough for this moment. Uh, Jim, you can take it over. Oh, thanks for, and yeah, the Big Club Network. No, thanks for that. Yeah, definitely a J5 success and uh, a great success for both of us. Um, let me turn to Sean, and there you are. Okay, Sean, um, we kinda, we, we've talked a lot about... Um, I mean, we've been talking about crypto and, and some of this has already been mentioned, but can you just talk, I mean, what do you think is a major obstacle to combating cryptocurrency crimes, you know, on a, on a global level? 
Great question. Uh, uh, good morning, Chief Lee, and good morning, uh, uh, Chief Langarak. It's, it's great to be with you all today, and, and thank you to Chanalysis for having, having me. Uh, that's a great question. So uh, the best way I can answer that is, um, you know, although most, if not all, U.S.-based exchanges have some type of AML compliance policy in place, not all international cryptocurrency exchanges do. So that, that's something that we found to be um, a significant challenge. And as a result, we're seeing a lot of laundered cryptocurrencies move through foreign exchanges. And so um, when these exchanges don't have a robust AML compliance program in place, it can be somewhat of a challenge to identify the criminals behind the schemes who don't properly identify themselves. And so in addition, some foreign exchangers intentionally don't have an AML compliance program, which facilitates additional money laundering problems. And so that is a, is a significant challenge. And this is really reminiscent of the BTCE case, which was pretty much a safe haven, safe haven for cyber criminals to launder Bitcoin. And but I think we all know how that ended. And uh, as a result, I think we can assume that others will eventually have a similar fate. Yeah, no, thanks, Sean. Uh, good, good points there. I, I think it's uh, no secret that more regulation, you know, equals more compliance. I mean, in general, so good, good points. Uh, let me, let me ask you one more question here. Um, you know, from your perspective, uh, do, do you think that J5 uh, is effective in working together to combat uh, tax evasion as it relates to cryptocurrencies? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, the J5 is working and coming up with the best way to manage taxation and cryptocurrencies together. Uh, I think in the past, our countries have been able to deal with taxation investigations with each other. Uh, cryptocurrency just brings in a new and a unique way that taxpayers can attempt to evade and defeat paying tax. Uh, and the J5 is trying to come up with the best way to handle and manage that. So, I mean, as, as everyone now knows, I mean, the J5 engage, engages in information sharing sessions and we're in, when we are often able to identify citizens of our J5 partners to include those of our own who misreport or flat out lie on their tax returns to include cryptocurrency uh, ownership status. And I bring this up because on the most recent US tax return form, we ask every US citizen to declare if they've transacted in cryptocurrency uh, and, you know, I mean, I think taxpayers who think that they can skirt the rules by using foreign cryptocurrency exchangers and services better think again, because the IRS will find out through the collaborative efforts with the J5 at either the challenges or obviously external to that. Uh, all great points, uh, Sean. Thanks. Thanks for that. And uh, Bert, uh, I, why don't we turn it back over to you, Bert? Thank you. And the folks of the Dutch jury. Um, we're talking about uh, tackling the, uh, the cryptocurrency crime, uh, mostly. Uh, so, Justin, maybe you can give us some insights. On, uh, what do you see as challenges uh, we face on that subject? Yes. Um, thank you for being here and saying, and I love to be on a panel together with Oleg and Sean, because we talk about <laughs> a lot about cases that now we're all in a different, well, setting. Love to see you both. Um, uh, back to your question, Bert. Um, uh, I think the challenges are various. So we have the challenge, of course, of the ongoing technical developments. Uh, the cryptocurrency environment is very high tech, you know, uh, encryption techniques that are really, uh, uh, are scaling up are really, really advanced. And next year, they're, they're even more advanced. So that makes it for us um, somewhat hard to keep up, of course. So we need all these very technical colleagues and, and all our Sean's and Sean, I know, you know, my colleague, Kelvin, you know, so we need all these uh, really smart girls and boys to help us uh, unraveling all these uh, uh, transactions. But um, these fast developments of techniques also uh, gives us in the future less uh, potential or less options to really trace the tran transactions. We know that already, privacy coins. I know that a lot of uh, people joining this meeting know what all these uh, new things uh, are, all the technical things are. And um, 
uh, the the uh, decentralized finance community is really evolving fast. Um, so all these uh, new things in in the world of finance, in the world of money, cryptocurrency, uh, peer to peer exchanges. So no man in the middle, no central third party in the middle. It's all really developing fast, and it's really technical and high. Well, that's really hard for us sometimes, but uh, that also means I think that we should shift our focus because we do have a focus as law enforcement on uh, tracing the transaction transactions, following the money. And I, I think we need to shift our focus somewhat more to KYC and onboarding processes because then you stop it at the front. Uh, if, if you don't have a client that's criminal, they won't uh, be able to, to act on uh, uh, on their criminal activity and launder the money through your exchange. So um, I think the focus should shift to, to KYC, to clients, uh, not only for law enforcement, but also for crypto communities, um, for exchanges, uh, but also for the supervisors. So all the, all the uh, organizations in every country, every country has a different name for that, that uh, that looks at the financial uh, uh, um, companies and has to control them, you know, has to see if they, if they act correctly on the KYC, like Sean also already mentioned. Um, they also has, have to make a shift and work together and exchange experiences like we do. So sort of J5 within the really, the tax authorities and the, and the, uh, uh, the supervisory authorities. That would be wonderful. They need to share more information before we get in place. So uh, shift to that KYC, to that onboarding for the crypto community uh, and for us and for the supervisors, that would be wonderful. Also, Thank I think you. it's, uh, but you already mentioned that Bert. I think it's uh, the crypto, um, the money flow is, is all over the globe and it's moving fast crypto. So um, uh, to freeze funds is rather difficult because uh, it, it hops quickly from exchange to exchange. So you're, uh, often we are a little bit too late, so we don't like yeah. that. So the, and the legal options, the international cooperation legal frameworks are not in place to act quickly on uh, uh, freezing funds, crypto funds. But you already mentioned that before, that's important to, uh, to be I able to act quickly. I try to, I try to. You're talking about <laughs> a, a, a shift, uh, uh, another kind of uh, mindset. What we're talking about with, uh, within J5 yeah. is more public-public uh, uh, working together, uh, cooperation. Yeah. With, uh, and uh, there's also maybe a possibility with uh, private uh, companies. You already uh, mentioned uh, some companies, uh, awareness, so uh, other kind of things. What do you yeah. see, see, see your options for cooperation between law enforcement and private companies? Uh, yes, I think there's a lot of, options to working together and you can tackle uh, uh, crypto crime, crypto crime, uh, we call it financial cyber crime, but crypto crime, you can uh, tackle it more efficiently if we work together. And it all starts uh, with not, not at first maybe exchanging information of cases because always that's hard for us. There are laws in place that prohibit us to share specific information in cases. But if you share experiences and, you know, uh, um, modus operandi you, uh, we're seeing, you can share that. And that helps everybody in tackling the uh, cryptocurrency crime. And we need to uh, co-op on that techniques. What do we see? How, how do, what is the best way to track fraud in ID information? Um, what do you do to detect uh, malicious transactions? Can we, as law enforcement, give you uh, the, the private sector information to be more efficient in tracking that uh, transaction? And I do think we try to um, give uh, the FATF a lot of information about uh, how we see uh, uh, the modus operandi and the criminals operating. And I know that um, together with uh, private companies that also participate in the FATF, and uh, they, um, we, we give information and help each other within that structure to, to tackle the cryptocurrency uh, crime better. I think that's very useful. So I would support every uh, cryptocurrency company uh, to, to participate in every FATF, uh, uh, well, 
organization meeting, whatever they do, uh, it's very, uh, very uh, helpful. Let's hope there are some uh, of them uh, in the audience uh, today. Uh, maybe it could be a next step. Yeah. It's also a challenge yeah. for uh, for J5 uh, to uh, to make more and more for public-private uh, cooperation. Uh, yeah. In my introduction, I uh, already told you that I'm proud of uh, Gert-Jan and Jocelyn. And I, it didn't change. They, I'm even prouder <laughs> now. So I, I give it back to, uh, to Jim. No, thanks, Bert. I, I feel the exact same way. Uh, thanks to Oleg and Sean for the, uh, you know, uh, answering the, the questions and providing some insight from real experts out there uh, doing this kind of work. So, Jesse, I'm going to uh, come back to you real quick. I, uh, those are the questions I think we wanted to kind of pose to, you know, the people doing the work. And maybe I'll turn it back to you for, uh, uh, sure. for, anything, I for any direction you want to go, yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, for, for whatever reason, uh, and, and I'll share this with the audience, we haven't received uh, uh, questions in yet. We haven't received any questions. And, and uh, so we're, we're about to be at the top of the hour. So if anybody has any, please, please submit them now. You know, you, again, you have the access. Everybody is, is willing to, to address any questions you might have. Um, but, you know, uh, otherwise... I, 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 have a question for you. I have a question for you, Jesse. From your for your company, you you heard our uh, stories. Uh, uh, I uh, I told something. Uh, Jim told something. Our experts. Uh, what 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 do you bring uh, home to, uh, to now? It's still morning in your country, but <clears throat> what brings us you this uh, this session? I, I you know I I think that what is most exciting for us, you know, we're we're trying to build trust in the ecosystem and, and chain analysis is uniquely positioned, right? In that we support both the public and the private sector uh, where we're trying to build more kind of cohesion, right? To build these relationships between public and private and to build the integrity of the ecosystem so bad actors can't abuse it. And, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in, in speaking with you all today, I mean, just, just highlighting the work that, that we've been able to do this year and to support for IRSCI, for Chief Lee and his team, you know, if, if you look at the volume of cases, you know, it's upwards of, of 1.5 billion US dollars in relation to cases just, just this year. Uh, and that's domestic. That's in the US. Imagine if this collaboration can continue to grow. And we're able to support, you know, global authorities on this, the virtual asset ecosystem, because of the transparency that is provided and the traceability of the blockchain, uh, the opportunities are amazing. And, and once the bad actors are really pushed out of this ecosystem, that's when it's really going to be able to thrive. And we're starting to see that, you know, th this is a domestic example, but it can be replicated across the globe. And so for me, that that's very exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, well, well, we gave the audience a chance, you know, this will be live there, you know, if, if people have questions, uh, after the session, please feel to reach, uh, feel free to reach out to chain analysis and we can potentially facilitate and provide them, uh, to both of these, these respective agencies. But, uh, you know, I would just like to say, uh, Bert, uh, you know, chiefly to the panelists, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for providing us with your time. We know how busy you all are. Uh, and, and I think these kinds of insights, the reason that we launched this, this links platform is to have these kinds of engagements and to provide this kind of access. So, you know, thank you again for supporting us. Um, we'll have the recording sent out via email this week. It will be on the links virtual landing page. You can check it out along with past sessions that we've done. Um, we have several additional link sessions that we're waiting to announce. So stay tuned as we'll be announcing uh, those sessions uh, beginning for for 2021 in the near future, and uh, thank you, thank you all again for your time. Thank you. Bye bye.